In Buddhist traditions, they tend not to make a sharp distinction between the heart and the mind, the heart being the part that wills and desires, has feelings, emotions, and the mind being the part that thinks and calculates, tries to reason things out. And as I say, the heart has its reasons, and the mind has its desires, its passions. There was a book that appeared a while back called Intellectual Passions. It was about the 18th century, which is the century of rationalism. And the author is trying to make the point that even though these people were rational, they were very passionate about it. They had very passionate ideas about the role that reason should play. They were looking for glory. They were looking for independence. They were looking for power. So there is no such thing as a pure thought without desire. After all, the Buddha said, all things are rooted in desire, all dhammas. That would exclude nibbana, taking it as the end of dhammas. But everything else, skillful and unskillful, comes from desire. So we have this mass of desires and thoughts and intentions that we've got to train. So we use the whole jitta, the whole mind, the whole heart, to train the heart and the mind. You see jitta in Pali, meaning a heart of goodwill, metta jitana, with a heart of goodwill. It's not just thoughts of goodwill, there's a heart that goes along with it. And all the verbs that have related to jitta are verbs about thinking and willing. So you bring all of this together. All of this is what has to be trained, and all of this is what's needed to train the mind. You see this in, when you're dealing with the hindrances. I was listening a while back to someone saying that you shouldn't try to fight the hindrances, you should try to learn from them, which is both right and wrong. You learn about them by fighting them. And in fighting them, you have to use a lot of skill. This is where the mind part comes in. You have to strategize. You have to outwit them. As the Buddha said, when something like this comes along, something like, say, sensual desire, first you have to watch for the origination. Why does it get sparked in the mind? What is it? And sometimes it's hard to see. Well, you watch it while it's there, for the purpose of not feeding it to see when it stops, because as is the case with any metal phenomenon, it's going to last for a while, and then if it's not fed any more fuel, it's going to go away. So you try to starve it of the fuel. You have to get yourself on the side against the hindrance. In fact, that's half the battle right there, because you'll find that in the Committee of the Mind there are lots of members who want to go for it. They think a thought of sensual desire would be really attractive, a lot of fun, nourishing refreshing. You want to see their reasons, so you set up against the hindrance. Say, well, I'm not going to go there, and it'll go away, and then it'll come back. And that's when you have to watch, why did it come back? And when it came back, why was there a part of the mind that went along with it, and which part, which mind part, which heart part went along with it? In other words, it's Sometimes it's a free association. There's just a random perception that you have that you've associated with sensual desire. It feels makes you attractive, makes you clever, makes you whatever. That's on the side simply a perception, or the heart side, the emotion side. In other words, there's no clear reasoning there. It's just an association and a feeling that goes along with the association, that you'd like it. You have to ask yourself, like what? Do you like the thought itself? Do you like the object of the sensual desire? Do you like the role that you are playing in your fantasy? What are you attracted to? 
where is the association that makes it attractive? Other times you find there's more of a reasoning going on, saying, well, this is natural. After I have a body, and the body wants this. I once tried that argument with John Fuang. I said, well, this is what the body wants, right? And, the body, and he said, the body doesn't want anything. The mind weren't here wanting. The body would just lie there dead. It doesn't care. So it's the mind that comes up with these reasonings, comes up with these excuses. It's like that image I heard one time, saying the mind is like a grab bag with lots of the Legos inside. And some of the Legos have been assembled into buildings or other objects, and some are just random Legos. And you reach in and you pull something out. And if it's assembled already, well, that tends to be more on the mind side, the thinking side, the reasoning side. Other times just random connections. But you learn a lot about the mind, because sometimes these random connections are really powerful. They go way back into your history. This is why in psychoanalysis they'd like to do free association, just to see where your random connections are. So as you set up against the hindrance, saying, I'm not going to go with it, and then notice that part of the mind will go anyhow. Look for why. John Mahabua talks about how he got to a point where he had been doing body contemplation. To the point where it was very, very quick. He'd look at anybody's body and immediately see it as taken apart, with the skin stripped off and just blood all over the place. There had been no thoughts of lust at all. But then he asked himself, well, when did the lust go away? Was, when was the moment? When was the insight that made it go away? And he realized there was no moment. So he began to get suspicious. Maybe it's just hiding. So he imagined a beautiful body right next to his, and everywhere he went, this beautiful body went right there. And this went on for several days, no reaction inside the mind at all. And then after the fourth day, he began to realize that part of his mind actually liked that body. So he realized that this problem hasn't been solved. So the next question is why? And he began to realize as he went back and forth between perceiving that body as attractive and perceiving it as unattractive, there was a part of the mind that wanted to see it as attractive. No matter how much you looked at the reality of the body, there was another part that just wanted it to be attractive wanted to have that perception of beauty. Well, why? What was the allure of that? It wasn't when he saw that allure, that was when he was able to see that it was totally worthless. And compared with all the drawbacks that come with sensual desire, that was when he felt this passion for it, that's when he totally let go of any kind of sensual desire. So you learn about the hindrances, you learn about them both as a mind function and as a heart function. Bring your whole heart and your whole mind to try to figure them out. Otherwise you try to get your heart on the side of wanting to be free. You get your mind on the side of trying to outwit them, seeing what is it that they do that fools you every time they come on and you go for them. And this is going to require good concentration. Of course, the irony is that you need to get the mind past these hindrances to really get into good concentration. But that's just an irony in theory. In practice, what it means is that you fight them off as best you can. This is why we have that chant about the 32 parts of the body so often. So we can immediately think of a way of counteracting our desires. But then they'll just be quiet for a while. They haven't gone away, they're just lying there quiet. But the fact that they're lying there quiet allows the mind to settle down. This is how we deal with all our defilements as we get the mind into concentration. Clear 
an area where the mind can settle down, knowing that it's not totally without danger, totally without problems, but it's good enough to settle down. And as you get the mind more and more on the side of concentration, you're going to convert the heart. It begins to see that the concentration really is a good place to be. And you're better off by not siding with the sensual desire, not siding with the other hindrances. And the reasoning part of the mind then can, can do its work to outwit the hindrance. That's what it means when it says that it's discernment that sees through them. It outwits them. So both the heart and the mind are needed to train both the heart and the mind. It's only when the training is total like this, dealing with all your mental and functions, all of your thinking functions, all of your willing functions, that the whole heart and mind can be free. <laughs>